I first want to thank everybody who's tuning in today. This is part of the Badger Institute Symposium Series, and uh, you know we've done uh, you know a variety of topics in recent days, including uh, tax reform. We have one next week on professional licensure reform. I'm particularly proud of this one though, because we, this this topic is is so topical and so important, and not just in Wisconsin or Las Vegas, but really everywhere in America. So I'm very proud of this one. And uh, the number of participants we have and the folks that are tuning in is really reflective of that. We have uh, people signed up today uh, from at least uh, three dozen police departments in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Kevin Carr, the secretary of the Department of Corrections is uh, signed up. I can't see everybody who's logged in quite yet. So uh, if you're there already, secretary, thank you. Uh, we have representation from the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Eastern District of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, from the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office, from the Milwaukee County Police Department, from the Sheriff's Department. Those are still separate entities here, Kevin, in, in Milwaukee. Uh, we have uh, representatives from really influential legislative offices in, in Madison. Uh, Nick Ringer is with us, and I want to mention Rick. He's a uh, a friend, a good friend to us here at the Badger Institute and a, and a friend to John Ponder. Uh, Nick runs Community Warehouse and Partners in Hope. And Partners in Hope actually has a partnership with, with prisoners in, uh, in Hope uh, in, in Las Vegas. And I, I mention that partly because I'm hoping that we can have some interaction with Nick later on, but also because if you look at the bottom of the invitation, you'll see some links and there's a video down there called Breaking the Cycle of Incarceration in Wisconsin Partners in Hope. And uh, that is all about Nick Ringer and John Ponder and the great things that they've done. And it proves that what we're talking about today isn't just theoretical. The things that have happened in Las Vegas can really happen elsewhere. We can work with them, maybe not exactly replicate what's, what John Ponder and Kevin McMahill are doing, but really work with them and emulate them and customize things elsewhere in the country. So this is, as the academics say, is kind of a scalable thing that we're talking about today. There are some other links at the bottom of your invitation that I hope all of you will have a chance to check out as well. Uh, an article we did on John Ponder several years ago called Unlocking Potential, which gives you all of the background we're not going to be able to talk about today. We released a recent uh, uh, policy brief called uh, Police Use of Force, How Common Is It? I think it really uh, puts into context some of the incidents that have been happening in this country. They're getting so much attention, and I'm hoping we can talk about that a little bit as well. Um, one procedural uh, thing here, I assume almost everybody who's tuning in and uh, it's growing by the second here. Everybody's probably used Zoom by now. So everybody probably knows there's a Q&A icon uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. We're going to have a discussion here with Kevin and John for about you know, 25, 30 minutes. And then we're going to leave another 25, 30 minutes after that for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, click on the Q&A tab at any point and just uh, ask the question. And I will, I assume, because not everybody will be able to see the questions that are asked, there'll probably be some redundancy and some overlap. So I'll sort through them and I'll ask the questions uh, at the, uh, after our discussion and we'll get through as many of those as we can. I'm, I'm going to, I told John and Kevin that I'd probably cut them off uh, here after 25, 30 minutes because I'm gonna ask a few questions here, but I know all the folks from law enforcement uh, I have a lot better questions than I'm going to have. So really looking forward to, uh, to, that, to that portion of our symposium today. Um, that having been said, I, I really wanna thank both of you. I, I hope that most people who are tuning in uh, know how special our guests are today. I'm going to start with um, Kevin McMahill before I talk to John a little bit. Uh, you know, Kevin is the undersheriff of the Metropolitan Department in Las Vegas, which includes what used to be at one time the Clark County Sheriff's Department and the old Las Vegas Police Department. He's got an enormous, enormous department. Uh, they've got up to, six, I guess, 6,000 uh, people, including civilians, that, uh, that uh, Kevin is really responsible for. There is an elected sheriff, but uh, Kevin is, as I think of it, sort of the, I guess, the COO of the department. And so he's a very, he's a very busy guy. Thanks for, thanks for turning your phone off for, for an hour and uh, sharing uh, all your knowledge and expertise with us, Kevin. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say and how you came to uh, really get involved with, with John. Uh, John Ponder, I, I hope all of you, uh, probably most of you have heard of John by now. 
Uh, John's got a fascinating history and and uh, has just done amazing things in Las Vegas, has helped thousands of people by now, thousands of ex-prisoners. And, uh, and, and John fits that description himself, re-enter society successfully through, through job training. There's a faith component through mentoring with law enforcement, which is something that I, that I really want to talk about. Uh, John, my first question, though, is uh, what's it like hanging out at the White House? So. Uh, you, you couldn't hear me giggling because uh, I was muted in there. Uh, it is, it's been just a, just an amazing uh, experience uh, interacting with the White House, uh, not only with the, the, uh, the events that take place had taken place with the pardon, but, but being in uh, those conversations early on uh, with the you know first step back and criminal justice reform and second chance employment. It's just really been a, a wonderful experience. If some of you don't know, John was uh, just pardoned very recently by President Trump. Uh, incredibly well-deserved, fabulous story. I hope somebody writes a book about you one day, John, and I'm, I'm very sincere about that. The story, of, the story of redemption and renewal there, your own personal story, as well as what you're doing there for others in Las Vegas, is, I, I, I love the story. It's so inspirational. So congratulations. Thank you so much. And I'm going I'm to I'm use a cheap plug to plug the book. It's Redeemed. The John Ponder story, and it'll be in bookstores soon. So somebody has written a book about you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'll try. Can I order it on Amazon? Yeah, but it's it, okay. it, it'll be another week or so before it's up and running. Oh, great. I didn't know that, John. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Kevin. Um, can I um, can I ask you um, how your relationship developed with, uh, John, it's an unusual connection, not just between the two of you. I, I know your friends, but, uh, between your organizations, uh, can I ask how you, uh, how that started, how you got through any internal resistance within the, within the department or even any policies or, or, or cultural impediments? Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, you bet. So, um, listen, uh, uh, in, and thanks again for having me, but um, I got to speak quickly here because I want to get all this in and, and not run out of time. And pretty simply, it's this. I was working as a captain in West Las Vegas, predominantly African-American neighborhood, and I'd had 13 murders in the first six months of uh, being the commander over there. And uh, not a single one of those cases was solved. So 13 young, dead black men, and we had a 0% solve rate. And so I was really looking around for um, different approaches to what it was that we were doing. And quite frankly, I had worked with a number of uh, groups that were representing um, formerly incarcerated individuals. And I was very disheartened because I, I'd seen a lot of federal money coming in and really nobody being helped. And so John came along, asked for a meeting with me. We met at a coffee shop. And I really didn't want to partner with them to begin with. And, but once you meet John and you hear his, his story and his vision, um, I decided to take another chance. And so as we move through that process, um, you know, listen, every police department listening here, I guarantee you has the same sort of policies in place that prohibit officers from consorting with persons of ill repute or associating with persons of ill repute. And so the idea was, well, how am I going to get beyond what this policy says within our organization. And quite frankly, we'd fired people for that uh, in years prior. And so I brought together um, about 60 people that I thought I had a significant amount of influence over and made a, a personal ask. And, and that bore out of the conversation that John and I had was how could we partner law enforcement together in Hope for Prisoners to serve as mentors and teachers and, and, and really embed themselves in this process so that we could begin to see not one another as returning offender and cop, many of whom may even have placed those individuals into the prison system, but really to, to recognize one another as human beings first, human being to human being. And, and, and really it got to the point where um, after those 60 people um, asked a lot of questions, I, I got about six or seven people that actually agreed to help. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, um, you know, it was, wasn't very um, uh, encouraging early on, um, but as we started the process and we began to work through many of the challenges, today I have more people from every rank, from police officer uh, at the at the lower end to, and civilians all the way up to and including deputy chiefs and assistant sheriffs. Um, the program takes a while to to grow. What happens is is that we 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 get into a place 
we start to see that humanity in one another and we really transform not only those returning offenders and John can talk about how we do that, but we allow for one another to, to make success. And a lot of times people ask the question is why, why would you get involved with this, this population? There's so many other populations. And, and I just simply answer is what population deserves more of an opportunity than that one that they have already had every strike against them. They've probably been in and out of the system. This cycle of recidivism uh, never seems to have ever been able to be broken. And we, we have been so successful here that we hover around 6% of our individuals that go through this program going back to prison. And so that's a very high level overview of it, but very simply breaking the culture of the organization uh, to work with these types of individuals took a while, but once you, once you get through it, both the police department and the returning offenders, and therefore the entirety of the community benefit from making sure that these people never go back to prison. Kevin, was there anything different about the culture of your department back then than any of any of these other departments all across America? Is there something that enabled you to do what you've done that can't happen elsewhere for whatever reason? Well, listen, I mean, um, we all came on the job. We, you know, I've been, thir- I just had my 30th year anniversary and Listen, I prided myself on being that sort of knuckle dragging cop putting bad guys in prison. Uh, luckily for me, uh, the previous sheriff and the current sheriff um, had the mentality that we were able to sort of decentralize our community policing efforts. Um, so while we do have a, like any police department worth their weight, uh, has a statement about their community policing and their commitment to it, the reality of it is, is that most of that is sort of headquarters driven. What we did was we decentralized it so that each individual area command, we have 10 of them, or precinct or whatever you want to call it, was able to develop programming unique and specific to the populations that they served. So the 89106 area that I had led in every single category that you don't want to lead in when it comes to crime statistics, murder, rape, robbery, gangs, homicide, you name it, we we were leading in it. And so... The ability uh, for the for that individual area commander to create programs that would have a meaningful impact within that geographic area was something that empowering individual captains that run those commands really allows for us to have a far more successful community policing effort here in Las Vegas, Nevada, than I think I see in many other places. Because if you're going to rely on the sheriff or the undersheriff or the chief to be the one to come up with programs that are meaningful, that engage authentically to the people that we serve, you're never going to be able to do that because I don't have day-to-day interaction with all of those people, but they and the people that they lead do. Yeah, I do want to come back to that community policing aspect in in a minute, but John, let me ask you from your perspective, I mean, talk about a leap of faith uh, on the on the part of uh, of folks like Kevin and his department. I mean, you had a leap of faith there yourself. Uh, part of it, I think, was a literal leap of faith. But how tough is it for folks, especially in this environment in America, where we just see all we see is a video of cops beating up on guys, sometimes out of context, maybe sometimes I don't know in context, but we don't we're not really getting an accurate perception of all the things that police do. It seems like it might be driving a, a lot of distrust. How do we get people like you to have faith in police and how important is that mentoring relationship to what you're doing? Right. Yeah. So and thank you for that question. And and I have to tell you that it is so incredibly uh, important uh, to be able to have those, you know, life rubbing up against life. Right. On both sides of the equation, Uh, because if you think about it, what, what, what it is that we're doing inside this partnership. Uh, with the people that we work with specifically that are coming home uh, from the prison system and returning back out to those communities. And the overall goal is to help them to live a successful life, to help them to not ever reoffend again. You know, in order for us to be able to do that, uh, it's important that we help uh, uh, instill in them a love and appreciation and a respect for the rules and regulations, the laws of the land, so they never reoffend again. We found that that opportunity gets enhanced when we bring them into relationship with the men and women who are upholding the law, right? And 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 out of that, right, I think that people begin to, uh, as they begin to interact with each other, as they begin to have a life rubbing up against life, because if you think about it, you look across the country, people don't trust police. 
right? We see it on the news. So, you know, they, they don't trust police. And the reason why that is, Mike, is because they're not in relationship with police. You know, if you think about it, what relationship could you ever establish trust unless there's life rubbing up against life and the spirit of complete transparency? And I think that out of that transparency uh, builds the relationship and out of that relationship, then the trust gets established. And you think about the effect of this, right? So we're getting men and women returning to community to help them out of that transparency, begin to view law enforcement from a different perspective. Mike, if you turn around the, the coin to the other side, it is helping men and women of law enforcement to view men and women who are coming home from prison that are truly fighting for a second chance as they're making their way back into the community. It's helping them to view people from this segment of the population from a whole nother set of lenses and thinking outside of the box. And I'm so grateful for our partnership uh, with Metro, honored to, you know, that, uh, you know, to have on the share of the mail here and the, and the over 100 officers that are there with their boots on the ground to help men and women not only not go back to the prison system, but to think outside the box to help them to begin to live life on the level that most people only dream of. Yeah, but John, you know, I'm giving short shrift to Hope for Prisoners and what you do because people can read about it and we only have half an hour and then questions. But, you know, mentoring always, to me, has always been uh, such an interesting part of what you do and particularly with police officers and law enforcement. But my recollection is that you have other mentors, right? And there are other, there are other, there are lots of entities in America that have a mentoring component. Why is it so important to have law enforcement actually as mentors versus others, versus other community leaders or or members, you know, other other members of the community. Sure. And it, it points right back to Mike that the, you know that relationship, right? The relationship that you have with people. And if you take a look at the law enforcement folks, um, you know, the different um, uh, the diversity of training and life skills and so forth and so on that they bring to the table inside that relationship. And again, you think about when uh, when they begin to interact with law enforcement, it's going to come to a point that they'll begin to view that officer as not the, uh, an officer from the police department. Right. And it, 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 looking at them as the heart of people. And I think that the minute that we do that, when that life begins to rub up against life and you begin to look past the badge, look past the duty belt and see the heart of a person that is being there to help. I think that that's when, you know, tr true transformation begins to take place. Hey, Kevin, can I go back to the community policing thing? I mean, I almost hesitate to do this because we've been talking about it for so many years and I'm sometimes not really sure what it means. I know that I know that you guys, uh, you know, were early adopters of community policing. And can you just talk about it just briefly about what a, a little bit more about about what that means and how that how that builds trust and whether it's whether it means anything a little bit differently where you are than anywhere else in the, in the country? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so, you know, I think one of the things that you do when you look at um, law enforcement leadership all across this country, I think that, you know, they do things like everybody else. We have major city chiefs and IACP and major city or major county sheriffs and national sheriffs and all these things. And everybody goes together and we talk about things. We try to learn from one another. And you talk about something called community policing, which, you know, really was there since the inception of policing. But Whoops, I think uh, I think Kevin just cut out on us, installed. I hope we, I hope we get him back. John, you want to jump in just for a, a second or we can move on to another question, but do you want to talk about what uh, your perception is of uh, whether Station, but, policing differs? Oh, oh there he is, he's back now. He's back. But, but what I will tell you is the, the probably the most important thing is, is that while everybody has a philosophy of what community policing is and certainly a statement that community policing is the core foundational aspect of their organization. I think when you really dive down into it, you kind of see much of the same things, right? And things like, uh, you know, turkey uh, uh, events during Thanksgiving, handing out food, um, Santa cops, where we buy underprivileged kids toys, um, you know, a, a national night out, all these kinds of things. But those are, those are just events, right? And events aren't what really get you down to the human to human level. And what, what we try to do, and, and look, we also did the same thing. When community policing first started here, we had a cop designed as a community policing officer. 
so they have the responsibility in one of our area commands for 220, 230,000 people. How can a cop ever do anything uh, meaningful when it comes to community policing? Then we created squads, entire squads of individuals that were responsible for community policing. Now we have an office of community engagement, which is basically a bureau responsible for it. But the, the real meaningful impact of that is, is that you have to empower police officers to, to believe in the leadership, to know that when they come up with things that will make an impact in the communities in which they're serving, that they have the full weight and support of not only the, the leadership of the police department, but really in bringing so many other people within the community together to make something happen. Because honestly, you know, you have these conversations around defund the police. Most of the time, the police are having to go out and beg to accomplish many of these things. We can have a community barbecue and I have to go beg, you know, different businesses to pay for the hot dogs and the hamburgers, the drinks and the chips and those kinds of things, or even set up a stage. But what, <clears throat> what we do is we spend a significant amount of time helping to bring those partners from the community in and then have a meaningful conversation about what will work. Things like starting a baseball team in the black community. Um, these, this, this helps lowered crime within one mile of, of that, that uh, baseball team being formed by 40% in one year. And that's the mothers and the fathers and the businesses and the police spending their own time and effort and energy and going out. I don't have to encourage a single person to do it. They do it because they love those kids. They love one another and they truly want to make an impact within those communities. I mean, have you had a lot of protests in Las Vegas in recent days? So uh, I didn't look at today's number. Uh, we probably have had uh, in total about 320 protests since all wow. of this started. Um, we, we, we have a very interesting, you know, we engage the protesters no matter whether they'll speak to us or not. In fact, a lot of times you'll see a protest here in Las Vegas and you won't see the police. That doesn't mean we're not there. We're certainly ready, but we try to have a, a unique approach to those. We've had what I would call four of those protests turn riotous. Uh, obviously, Shea Michelinus, one of our officers was shot in the head during one of those but uh, what story doesn't get tell, told is that was a, a local kid who was in a fight with his girlfriend and he went outside and was firing at the protesters and uh, unfortunately for us actually shot uh, one of our police officers in the head. And so I can't attribute that to the riots that were occurring, but we um, have a just a really, today's world, there's a protest for everything, literally. Left, right, center, whatever you wanna talk about. And, you know, uh, that's again, another conversation, but about transparency and accountability and getting out in front of it when you have these things. You know, we have, and, and I'm sorry to belabor this, but I think it's really important, particularly for what happened in Kenosha. Um, I'm sorry that your communities are going through that, but body-worn cameras are the single most effective tool that I think we've ever provided to police. Um, I have thousands of police officers who've been cleared of that. And we also were able to take those body-worn cameras and utilize them during these protests for both effective prosecution and targeting of those individuals. And so they realize that we don't target protesters as a whole. Um, you know, there's always been a few, few conversations in and around it, but we also helped to bring out members of different groups within our community, like the hundred black men, um, our MAC community. We brought in uh, pastors to all of these things to provide buffer zones between the police and those that were protesting. And so out of that 315, only four of them have descended into any uh, amount of rioting and with very, very little property damage. Wow, that's amazing. Hey, John, um, you're all you're all over the country now. Um, can can you comment on that? Any any reason why there have only been four that have, I guess, uh, resulted in, in um, you know, violent, I don't know if they were violent protests, but um, that have kind of descended into that and why it's different in Las Vegas. Does that have anything to do with the uh, interaction, the interactions that you guys have built up over time? Sure. I think it 100% does. And, you know, I'll have to just uh, uh, talk about uh, what Kevin talked about, talked about with the community oriented policing. And when I tell you that it is the most phenomenal uh, the vision of uh, community police and a model that I have ever seen. And let me tell you the reason why. Uh, it is it is a true community oriented police. So out of those 10 different area commands or precincts, right, you have divisions of people that are dedicated into those neighborhoods. So these are the officers that are in those particular communities every single day 
These are officers that are attending churches and synagogues and going to the mosque. These are officers who have their boots on the ground, building up relationships with folks inside the schools, reading to the kids, and not only having the you know the community engagement, but it all turns uh, all uh, results into building up relationships. And I think that that is the reason why you do not see uh, the, the tremendous uprising that you're seeing in communities across the country. Can we talk about the word de-escalation a little bit? I know it's usually used for police in reference to individual incidents, but John, let me ask you about, um, a, about a broader usage of the term and some of the, I, I think maybe there's some de-escalation happening um, with, with protests as well there because of the relationships with the community. Um, it, it, and I, I don't know if that's a proper usage of the term, but um, do you think that because of the trust, again, that there's been the ability to kind of de-escalate what might be some, some violence, uh, you know, with some of these protests, is that uh, part of what's happening? Uh, you know, I think it is 100%. And it, you know, uh, it uh, directly, correlates with those relationships that get uh, built up. And I think that when you're building those relationships early on before the instance actually happens, that's when it could be much more effective. Now think about this, if, if let's just say if your, your house was in the middle of the storm and the windows are blown out and you have a piece of plywood and a ladder trying to go up to the third floor to try to repair that window, it's, it's not gonna happen. But if you're making sure that those things are done right up front, right, to make sure that, you know, it, it, everything's all safe and secure, then this way it's going to be much more effective. And I think that this is what this police department has done uh, early on, having the boots on the ground, connecting with uh, the children and also connecting with the parents. And, and again, putting people in the place, uh, in a position in life where they're going to be able to thrive. It all stems up out of, uh, of that of those relationships. Yeah, the problem, of course, in some areas is that you do have some outsiders who are coming in who aren't members of the community and add a different dynamic to some of these to some of these protests. But that aside, hey, Kevin, can you talk about de-escalation? And I know it's so tough to look at some of the video that's been happening uh, on so many levels. It's hard to it's hard to look at. It's hard to get it's hard to get context. Um, but can you talk a little bit about whether or not police in general, either, either out where you are or elsewhere, can maybe in those rare instances, you know, when, when things are getting out of hand and when force is used, and we can talk about those statistics too. Can you talk a little bit about whether, you know, police can do a better job of de-escalating, whether it's a, and whether it's a, a training issue or not? Yeah, so listen, not every instance can be de-escalated. That just has to be said from the very okay. beginning. Um, but that being said, um, I'll tell you that in 2010 Metro, we had shot 25 people and two of those were very um, high profile incidents that quite frankly, they did not need to be shot. And so we underwent a comprehensive reform process with the Department of Justice Cops Office. And it's, it's been published widely. A lot of uh, 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 different agencies have read that. But prior to 2010, we didn't have some, I'm embarrassed to say, we didn't have some very key things when it comes to training. And we thought we were at the top of the list, right? Things like a sanctity of life statement in your use of force. If you don't, if you're not from the very get go teaching that life matters the most to your people that have the ability to take life, then where are you really at? And then secondly, on the de-escalation piece, we didn't have a de-escalation policy. And so what's really interesting about de-escalation is that what you really need to be focused on is, is how do you de-escalate from the sense that you're taking into account things like time and distance, numbers of officers, education, training, and then realistically, if you're not getting to this point is, is what is the humanity of it? Because we all know that there's, a, there's shootings all over the country that they describe as lawful but awful, right? And, and those are the ones that seem to, to you know, cause a lot of, of, of challenge for people. Our experience here is that after 72 hours, we really, we, the sheriff and I receive a, a, a video with all the body worn camera. And the day that the shooting occurs from the scene, one of our captains puts out a, a YouTube video about what they know. 72 hours later, we play all of that video, good, bad, and ugly. And the community at least has a sense of what happens. And what I can tell you after doing that for 10 years now, I don't even really think they care if we provide any commentary whatsoever anymore. It seems like what the community reacts to is, is we press play and they make a determ determination. Did that individual need to be shot or did the police screw it up? 
And then what's really important about this throughout that entire process is we see things that are horrific from a, a training and tactics, leadership and supervision perspective that people don't necessarily look at um, when you're a civilian watching a body worn camera when a shooting occurs. But we have this robust review process on every single use of force incident that goes to a panel that actually outnumbers the individual, the civilians outnumber the commissioned people. And the reason that I'm bringing that up into de-escalation for you is, is that you can't have an honest conversation about de-escalation until you have an honest conversation about the failures in a use of force. And when you look at it criminally, it's easy to say there's not a, a failure. When you look at it administratively, you can always find areas to improve it. And the last piece I got to tell you, we also take what we learn from each one of those reviews, take it back to our reality-based training and, and do those exact same scenarios for the entirety of the agency, but have them arrive at an ultimate different outcome than the use of deadly force by employing the time, the distance, the training, the education, and the humanity. We also provided a lot more tools in the past than what we had uh, that allows them to have options from further distances than only using the handgun. You know, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about is just is basic transparency. I mean, you, that's you, a big you, part of it. You touched on it with body cameras. You touched on it with making video available pretty quickly um, with some of the other things that you're talking about. And and often, oftentimes, more often than not, I, I think what I'm hearing and have always assumed is that that benefits police officers that uh, that most of the time they're doing their job the right way. And 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 having some some video and uh, being transparent about it is uh, is 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 a good thing for law enforcement. Am well, I, listen, I, 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 yeah, listen, I'll tell you, when we when we were so we actually had two officers murdered at, in a CC's pizza after the uh, Bundy cow incident. And um, the first time that we released that that video was surveillance video from a, a pizza shop. And I would have thought my homicide guys were going to throw me out the fifth floor window here. <laughs> um, the reality of it is, is that, you know, in today's world, and this is what I would just say to those law enforcement that are listening, that are hesitant to to release this video. Um, if a citizen records it, it's going out, right? You had no control there in Kenosha of that guy putting out his cell phone video. Every incident around the country that video comes out, there's somebody on the prosecution side, there's somebody in administration, some lawyer that says, you can't put that out, it's gonna harm the, the, the future prosecution of the case. It's never harmed the future prosecution of a case at, since we released this video. It's just not true. But what happens is the community thinks that you're hiding something, that you're taking time to do something. What I know about policing is there's no secrets in policing. They always come to light sooner or later. And so why not put it out there, put out the information, let people see it and they make judgments on it. And I think in my opinion, that's a huge part of why it is that when we have subsequent to these riots, I think, I, I believe where we've at, we've had six officer involved shootings. They all go out. You can find them all on LVMPD.com. You can see both the scene briefing and then the, the sheriff. Uh, most of the time, it's an assistant sheriff doing the briefing now. Um, but you can go in and watch each and every one of those, and they're all they're all sent through the community. And and we have a really good response. And still today, over uh, around 80% approval rating from our community in our latest polls. Yeah, Kevin, I really appreciate how forthright you are on that. I also want to tout some uh, research that we've done at the Badger Institute very recently on use of force. And of course, we're always going to talk about these uh, these use of force incidents that involve guns and they get so much media attention and should. But use of force is really actually pretty rare. I mean, there are a quarter of a million arrests in Wisconsin in the average year. And one of the problems is that we can't get use of force data for the entire state or for most of the, not easily anyway. I mean, I, I, think if we, I think if we called each of the police departments that are tuned in today and asked them, they probably have some type of, some type of use of force report that's a public record, but it's, I have to say it's kind of hard to get at, but we looked at use of force in three of the larger departments, um, at least a couple of whom are tuned in today with Milwaukee and Madison and Green Bay, and they do a good job of keeping track for the most part, although they use different, different standards and definitions. And so um, what we found is that of those quarter of a million arrests, and those are just arrests. I mean, that's a small subset of all the interactions that police have. There are millions and millions of, of interactions just in Wisconsin between police and, and individuals in the community. We found that only about 3% involve any use of force at all. And about 70% of those 
involve just bo involve bodily force, right? Don't involve the use of a gun. So use of force is really something that's very rare. It's not to say that at times it's it's unjustified. I mean, sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's not. We didn't get into that issue. But putting that in context, I think is important. At the same time, I just wanna say that I think it's also important that we in this state be a little bit more transparent uh, and perhaps have uh, some legislation that mandates that everybody uh, really make make public their use of force statistics. And I think that would be a great thing for law enforcement, really. I think it would disabuse some people of this this sense of um, of distrust that really exists um, in, in, in the community. So um, just, um, again, um, uh, touting, touting some of our own research that I think would be helpful in terms of uh, building trust between communities and police departments. I, I have a ton more questions and I'm happy to ask them, but it's it's already 1136 and we told people we get out of here by 12. And I just wanna give um, as many members of our audience a chance to ask questions as as possible. So I'm gonna move on to that and then we'll give uh, both of you a chance to um, at, at the end to really weigh in on, uh, again, on uh, you know any recommendations you have for us as a state here. Um, so, um, what, uh, what percentage of your mentors are in law enforcement and what do they do exactly as mentors, John? Sure. So, um, uh, as, uh, uh, with the 500, um, men and women that we've trained up to become mentors, uh, 20% of those are, uh, from law enforcement. Uh, and they do a, a variety of all things. Sometimes that looks like uh, the mentoring uh, and, the, and, and the training, uh, the training on leadership coming in, things of that nature. Uh, there's sometimes there's one-on-one -on -one connectivity uh, with the, uh, you know, the mentor and the participant. But again, it's just creative ways to, um, to be able to um, uh, connect formerly incarcerated people with men and women of law enforcement. I think that our law enforcement has done a phenomenal job at coming in and teaching training uh, on leadership principles. So all those leadership principles that an officer has the privilege to be exposed to in order for them to be promoted from sergeant to lieutenant to captain, uh, we're exposing uh, formerly incarcerated people to that same level of training that's gonna help them to, you know, just get up to the next level in life. Yeah, hey, John, John talk about I I'm sorry, sorry okay. John. Could you talk about the uh, the fact that they come in in plain clothes and the, the class they teach, and then the sort of the big unveil? Yeah, oh, absolutely, 100. So uh, a lot of the work that we do, and I'll try to put this in a nutshell. Our be our work begins uh, a lot pre-release. So we're going into uh, the Department of Corrections and inside our detention centers uh, early on, up to 18 months prior to them getting released, to make sure that we can surround them with a whole gamut of services, uh, not only leadership and life skills, but also bring in the vocational training, so that we can have that training directly with employment once they get released. Now, once they get released, Release, we take them through this very intensive, what we call a pre-vocational leadership workshop. And it's not only things to be able to help them to get a job and maintain the job, but this is where we lay down the foundation so that they could, you know, build up a brand new life to increase the probability of them never, ever reoffending again. And in th in, uh, throughout that process, now I want you to picture, if you will, you have 30 men and women who have just come home from the prison system. Some have done two years, some of them have done 30 years. And inside that training, again, teaching, training, things from the importance of winning attitude, goal setting, time management, things of that nature. But we have a segment of that training to where we uh, bring in, um, you know, up to 20, 25 uh, officers from the, the, the program. If you picture, if you will now, um, that, that these are formerly incarcerated people, that the last people just come over prison, last people they want to see is be inside a room with police officers that are in full uniforms, sometimes it's the gang unit and their and their gang colors and you know captains and and lieutenant all the way down to our community oriented police. But what what happens is that 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 nervousness gets diffused as our officers come in, and they don't come in talking about police stuff. They don't come in talking about I'm a cop. What they do is they say, hey, listen, my name is, you know, officer so-and-so, captain so-and-so, been on the department for, you know, 23, 25 years, and I've been in gang task force and SWAT and so forth and so on. And then they say, well, that's what I do, but let me tell you who I am. And then these officers begin to share very transparent, extremely transparent stories <laughs> about themselves. 
And as they begin to share that level of transparency, then the men and women are looking at law enforcement officers who are standing there in full uniform, talking about stuff that cops don't normally talk about. And I think that when they when when that happens, they begin to look at that uniform, not as a police officer, but as the husbands, the wives, the mothers, and fathers, the, the sisters and brothers that live in the same community that we live in. We have a component to where uh, working with uh, with the diversity division to where we have uh, officers fresh out of the academy. And these are officers that have been to training academy. Now they're about to get assigned to a different area command. But before they get assigned to that area command, we take five or six or seven of them. And that when we start that pre-vocational training workshop with the 30 men and women to come home from prison, we, we get five or seven of them. They come in and, and go through the process. And nobody in the room knows that they're cops, except for wow. me. They come in, in uniform. So they're going through the training process and, and they're, they're, they have a chance to work on exercises together. They, they have a chance to break bread. They take breaks, walk around the building together, getting to know each other. And then on that particular session, four days into it, where the other officers walk in in full uniform, then the men and women come in with the other officers that are in full uniform. And when I tell you that there is not a dry eye in the house, because now, and some of the stories, I'll tell you one real, real quick. It was one guy that did almost 40 years. He was an elderly gentleman, 42 years old. And it was a young cop, 22, 23 years old. And when he walked in in his uniform, the, the guy who just came home from prison, he starts weeping. And he was like, oh, man, you're a cop? Oh, man, I can't believe you did this to me. But he's weeping. Oh, man, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Then he stood up, a guy who just came home from prison, 40 years, who admitted on Monday morning that he hated the police, hated the police. And I'm trying to convince him, bear with me. And he stood up in that room as he was crying and said, we're still going to go fishing. We're still going to go on that fishing trip. And, and, and in that... <laughs> Listen, but in that moment, you drop the mic and we're done now. The mindsets get shifted. And when you can multiply that across a room full of people, then they truly begin to see men and women from law enforcement as the human beings that they are. And more importantly, the officers that come out of that training academy, as they're there with command staff, and they see how command staff are treating people who are returning to the community, I believe that those young officers are going to pick up things in that room that's going to help carry them into an incredible career as they're walking into a culture of a police department that has changed. Man, I just love that story. It changes that whole old dynamic about discovering that there was it was actually an undercover cop in plain clothes and being happy to discover that. And, you know, instead of the opposite, John, you're very prescient. You answered. We're getting a, a good a good number of questions and a few of them are along the same lines. I think you've answered them. Talk about how you bring reentering citizens into your program together with law enforcement. I think you answered that. Um, you teach your participants who have had negative interactions with law enforcement that police are their friends, quote unquote. Um, is that an accurate description? Why do you do that? And does it have an impact? I think you pretty much answered that. But let me add one little thing as well. The folks who are going through your program, and I think there have been thousands by now, all voluntary? Oh, absolutely. They are voluntary. Yes. Yeah. And is, is friends, I mean, is that the proper description of, 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 of the relationship, friendship? Is that, the, is that the proper description? I mean, you know, because, I mean, you know, maybe I'd... You know, maybe there still is a little law enforcement, uh, you know, authority component that maybe is needed at sometimes. I don't know. How does that work? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that it is. It's all about becoming friends, and you know, we we have this thing, um, you know, within our organization, and you know, we have these big graduations over at the headquarters of the police department, where literally 50, 60, 70 officers at every graduation people from the community. We have Department of Corrections come out and drove, parole and probation come out and, and droves. But more importantly, 
not, they're there to honor the graduates, to let them know that we are here. We are your friends. We want to support you in any way to help you to be successful. But their family members are there, their husbands and wives, their moms, their dads, but more importantly, their children are there. And when they see the level of support from law enforcement and a room full of police officers, and you have a uh, a, a, a sheriff or, or one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, folks in law enforcement celebrating them and giving them encouraging words, and when they in unison, you know, refer to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department as our friends, it resonates inside the building. And you think about what it is that we're doing by doing that. Them recognizing them as our friends, and the children in that room are looking at mom and dad who are graduating about to go on a whole nother vist of life. And they see mom and dad who just came home from prison saying that police officers are our friends. I believe that we're reaching down and touching the next generation of, of, of the kids in our community, helping them to grow up in the community that we're not looking at police officers as the enemy. They are truly yeah. our friends that are there to help them not ever go back to prison again. One, one quick follow-up before we move on to all these other questions. I hope everybody caught one of the things that John said almost in passing, which is that the graduation ceremony actually, I don't know if it always does, but at least occasionally does take place within Kevin's department, actually in their facility. That And Kevin, if, 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 that's, if that's accurate, I, I think it is. Can you just talk very briefly about about how difficult it is to actually to actually allow that to do that? It, it, was that a was that was that tough to get done? I mean, I know you're running the place. Maybe you could just do whatever you want, but I think this has been going on for a while. Uh, it, it, well, pre-COVID, they've been going on here now for a couple of years, and and the okay. first it was another one of those moments. I'll be very candid with you when we were talking about doing, I'm like, Oh, I don't think that's a very good idea. And then, and then we just kind of, just kind of do it. Right. And, and so but what, I think one of the things that's really, and there's a lot of, there's always a lot of jokes, you know, I always address the guys that go, oh, I'll bet you none of you thought you were going to be here without handcuffs or in the interrogation room, you know, here at police headquarters. And you get that kind of quiet laughter for a second. And then um, they go out and we applaud them as they come in. There's, the dignitary, I can't, we have to beat the dignitaries off nowadays because they all want to talk. They all want to show up. They all want to be part of it, give certificates. And, and so with, with all those officers, but I think there's one thing I, I, in that first question, I just want to address to you. And that is very simply, this is that one of the most basic behaviors of a leader is to do what you say you're going to do. And what I think when you talk about them, uh, the, 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 the members of hope, and the police officers coming back through is that we spent a lot of time working to make sure that they received meaningful employment subsequent to completion of this program, because it doesn't do us any good if we're not ever going to acknowledge the fact that unemployment is and underemployment is far higher in communities of color in every one of our cities than it is in, uh, in the white neighborhoods. And the reality is, is that it's very difficult for these people to come back. They couldn't get identifications. They couldn't get an interview. They didn't have the clothes to actually go to an interview in. They didn't know how to get to work on time or what the importance of that is. This is all the stuff that John's group and my group together collectively teach to them. But we also have really pushed the envelope so far beyond the tradition that we had so many different employers that would have never given a chance to a returning offender to work in their 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 facilities because out here, you know, gaming is a major employee. Gaming had regulations. They can't hire a returning offender and there's cer still certain jobs that they can't, but today they've all opened their doors and we have as many jobs that pay meaningful wages. Uh, in fact, we have more meaningful pay jobs paying meaningful wages than we have the ability to put people through this program. So that has been the embracement of this entirety of the, of the community so that, because look, I just break it down to you like this, whether I have a, a Clark County detention center that has upwards of 4,100 people in it prior to COVID. I could, we could work with the prison system. We could work when they come back here. And most of the time you teach them how to be an auto mechanic or a chef. I don't know about you, but if the only thing I had to teach me was how to be an auto mechanic, I'd be back out on the streets committing crime again. So you have to take what, part of the hope is, is what is your hope and your passion? And do that through the entry process that John does. You find out that, hey, I wanna do X or whatever it is. 
And then we work to find an employer that will teach them, guide them, mentor them. And also as a package, we come together to that employer to say, hey, if you're having troubles, let us know. Those employers today will tell you that most of these graduates that have come to them are the hardest working, they care the most, and have succeeded unbelievably beyond our wildest dreams. Yeah, I hope we can do another another symposium uh, one day and get Nick Ringer involved and talking about the transition to work and, and, and that whole thing. And we're, we're trying to get more involved in that as well. Let me ask a couple other quick questions from law enforcement here. One for you, Kevin. Uh, it's, a, it's a culture question, um, touched on it a little bit, but does changing use of force policies drive culture change with rank and file officers, or does culture change lead to needing to change and improve use of force policies? Kind of a chicken and an egg question. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I, look, I'm, I'm just one person, but I'll tell you this, I have never seen a policy change culture. Culture trumps policy every single time. If you cannot, it, sometimes police, and sometimes police culture, you literally have to break it over your knee. Um, and, you know, one of the things about leadership oftentimes is that we all want to be liked. It's an inherent need for every one of us. Um, things like even implementation of a body worn camera. Look at agencies all over the country that have resisted the body worn camera. We just took a to totally different approach to it, which was you don't do anything wrong. You have nothing to, to worry about. Now, I didn't come up with the body worn camera. And I, I, you know, I'm in uniform about half the time. Um, that's just another tool. And there's a lot of people that don't feel the same way about it, but now they see, in fact, I can tell you, I speak to every officer that uses deadly force. And in those instances where the officer did not turn on the camera, they say, sir, I'm so sorry. I wish I would have had my camera on. Now there's been a couple of times that they didn't have time to get it on, or sometimes it's just simply a mistake that they didn't turn it on. But the reality of it is, is that sometimes as you're making that sort of leadership decision, you have to take the best available information to you. De-escalation policies, you can't not argue that they're the right thing. And so instead of me focusing on a lot of what goes on in the head of police officers, I always take it right to the heart of police officers. And culture change takes a while, but it's leadership driven and leadership demanded. And then you have to inspect what you expect, because if you don't, the culture will never change. Um, we've got uh, only less than 10 minutes left and some great questions. So I'm going to try to zip through them as quickly as possible. Some of them are just sort of factual ones. Hey, John, um, you said you have a 6% recidivism rate. Um, I guesstimated before that it was a couple thousand people, but how many really have participated in Hope for Prisoners over the years? So we've, we've worked with a little over 3,400 uh, wow. men and women since our, uh, since our inception. Um, here's a super important question. Uh, it's no surprise that much of the public is seemingly frustrated with the police based on the media narrative and the viral video clips. I would ask both of you um, on behalf of, uh, this is an anonymous question, what can, but so important, what can we as regular community members do to help ease police community relations? What can the rest of us do? Kevin, I'll yield to you first. What can the rest of you do? I th well, I think getting involved is, is a, a really important piece of it. You know, there's a lot of different things, that, at least in my organization, that you can become part of. And the Metro, Metro Multicultural Affairs Council, we have people from every walk of life that the sheriff and I meet with once a month. In fact, we did that yesterday. Um, but also, you know, look, I, I think it's really important not just to talk about getting involved with the police department necessarily, but because, and it's the same thing with the mentor program. If you wanna get involved, get involved with something that matters to your heart, whatever that is. If it's feeding the homeless, get involved with it, right? But become a voice because no matter what it is that you're passionate about, you have to sit down and figure out how it is that we can make collective change for the better. And sometimes what you find is, is that that culture exists outside of policing every bit as much as it exists within policing. And if, if we continue to find what it is that drives each one of us as an individual, we find more in common than we find as a difference. And if you're really interested in this police use of force, then get involved with it. Get involved with your local police department. Get involved with your sheriff. You know, the sheriffs are elected. That We don't tell anybody no. We try to do what we can, but there's a lot of dumb things that are being suggested around use of force. 
And you know, some of them aren't going to come. Some of that reform is not going to, to come to, to fruition because as in many of these cases, as you're going to see across the country, people got too far down the road and, and insisted on charges on officers that are never going to be charged because they didn't do anything criminally. But when you look at it, it doesn't look right. And police agencies have done a terrible job around the country of actually putting out the information and letting the public see it for themselves rather than putting it out and, 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 and hiding it and not addressing, you know, what oftentimes is the elephant in the room is this just looks bad. And so, you know, there's a saying that goes around today is if you mess up, fess up. They understand that when you acknowledge that you've made mistakes and here's what you're doing to correct them. You just have to make sure that you're having honest conversations at the human level. Hey, John, we only have time for just a couple of more just really quick questions. We only have five minutes left, so I'm going to skip ahead to another one. Um, how do you address the financial aspect of implementing these type of programs? You know, where's your money? Where's your money come from? Yeah, you just got to do a whole lot of praying, spend a lot of time <laughs> yeah. down on your knees. Okay. You know, the, the, the bulk of, of things that we do comes off of, you know, people who believe in the mission, right? Uh, comes from personal and private, uh, you know, foundations, grants, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we work very closely with a lot of churches that support what it is that we do. You know, we do have uh, grants from the Department of Justice uh, and the Department of Labor that help us to do, you know, that upfront job training and things of that nature. But, you know, we, de we depend on, you know, resources from outside the community that would allow us to work outside the parameters of what the grants cover. But for the first three to five years, we went month to month trying to figure out how we were going to keep the lights on. <laughs> That's not I a lot. Um, yes. I, I want to give both of you just a couple of minutes here before we close up to talk about anything that you think is important that we've missed. But, John... Let me ask you first to maybe wind this into it. And this is a this is a question um, from, again, it's anonymous. Uh, you know, you had a criminal past and a lifetime, uh, an early lifetime, I guess, of, of negative experiences with law enforcement. Again, I mean, what, what wow, what a story, what an inspiration, John. But really, what changed your perspective? If you could right. talk about that and then add anything else that you that we need to know from you as we sure. close out here, we'd appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. I'm going to try to unpack this as quickly as I can. For me, hands down, it was my relationship with Jesus. And what I learned inside that relationship, uh, I'll share this with you. If you ever think about how close that word enemy comes to the inner me. And I had spent a lifetime fighting enemies on the outside until I took a look at the enemies that were laying dormant on the inner me. And once I conquered the enemies on the enemy, with God's help, the enemies on the outside disappeared. And in that moment, regardless of what it was that I was in and out of the judicial system, hating the police and don't want to have a conversation with them, running from them and so forth and so on, I had come to the realization, and this is a message for everybody in the earth, I had come to the realization that for me, the police were never my enemy. It was always what was going on on the inner me. I'm the one that was doing whatever it was that I was doing. The minute I saw that black and white, bing, game on. But once I conquered that enemy on the enemy, they disappeared. Right? There's a passage of scripture in the Bible that says that, you know, when I was a child, I thought it like a child, I acted like a child, and I did childless thing. But when I became a man, I put the childless things away. And the minute I put the childless things, childless things away, you know, some of my best friends on this planet are men and women from law enforcement. Honored to call them friends. John, we are honored to call you a friend. That is so uh, that is so elegant and and uh, and articulate. We're so thankful for you giving us your giving us your time today. I hope on another day we can talk about the faith component a little bit more. Kevin, I hope we can we can uh, talk a little bit more about about, again, some of the things we talked about with law enforcement, but also the work transition. Kevin, can you add anything that we've missed today that you think we just really need to know? And uh, maybe I'll put you on the spot publicly and see if we can get you on one of these calls again at some point when, uh, you know, when you have an, another half hour that opens up. <laughs> Listen, I've spent a lot of time in the last uh, few months and certainly on these Zoom calls in the last few weeks with a bunch of black pastors. So I don't know how it is that I'm supposed to follow up behind John <laughs> and his enemy and enemy. Right. But I will tell you this. Right. Um, I, 
what I'd say to the, the, the folks on the call is, is that if you want to start a program like this, if you want to make something like this happen, just take the step. Um, you know, there was a lot of praying and, and, and a lot of challenge. And we certainly had challenge when it came to people that did reoffend and, and tried to put a black eye on the program and um, on the police department as well. And what I'll, what I'll say is, I know that this is changing lives. I know it's transforming lives and I know it's saving lives. And uh, if, if, like, if you believe like I do, um, that all lives matter, black lives matter, all, every life matters, we have a duty and a responsibility to change the way it is that we police our communities. Um, that's going to be part of the rest of most of our careers. Uh, this is a great example of, of some of the steps that you can take. I know there's many out there. I know Milwaukee's already doing it and God bless you and good luck to your program. Uh, I think though with the Badger Institute, Mike, and what you all are doing and the numbers of people that you bring together, I think your state is well situated for success. And so for that, congratulations and uh, good luck moving forward. Thank you. This video is being recorded and it'll be available on our website, which is uh, badgerinstitute.org. But uh, can law enforcement officials in Wisconsin contact either of you if they have further questions? You bet. Oh, absolutely. Please do. Sure. And I'll tell you what, uh, anybody that wants to um, get that contact info um, directly from me, it's uh, Mike at badgerinstitute.org. Um, uh, John's got a great website too. John, what's your website again? It is, it is Hope for prisoners.org. Great. And um, I would just say too that we have another symposium uh, coming up next Wednesday. Legislators from Missouri are going to discuss licensing reform. What we try to do at the Badger Institute is find the smartest people really in America, people with the most experience, people like Kevin and John, and try to learn from them. And we're going to try to do that next week with license reform. But um, boy, on a personal level, thank you so much to both of you. I'm so inspired by what's happening. And um, you know, I, I, I love the I love the title of this thing, Hope for America, right? Like, uh, you know, these are uh, troubling times in so many instances. And I, 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 I just love what I heard today about, hey, maybe if we can just have a little bit of personal interaction and uh, learn from each other, maybe there is hope. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, anybody else wants to shoot an email, wants more information, just uh, let me know or go to our website. Thank you so much for tuning in.